Join us online for a unique virtual conference experience, life cycle planning, what goes around comes around, taking place on September 19th, 2023. Unlike other events that primarily cater to a select few, this conference is designed to provide strategies that are applicable to a broader audience. Irrespective of age, geographical origin, or the position on the wealth spectrum, Attending this event will equip you with valuable insights to immediately enhance the value you offer to clients. Register today at iwicentral.org slash LCP to secure your spot. We're proud to welcome you to the Exceptional Advisor podcast series brought to you by the Investments and Wealth Institute. This series aims to help you to better serve your clients, differentiate yourself from the competition, and enhance your ability to communicate those differences. Hi, I'm your host, Bob Powell. Uh, So, Todd, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Bob. Thanks for having me here. Uh, It's a pleasure, and I'm honored to be on your podcast today. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. And before we get going, for the benefit of folks who may not be familiar with you and your work, do you mind giving us an overview? I am currently the Pickett Professor of Entrepreneurship at Gonzaga University, uh, and I came there in 2010 to create a brand new program, uh, a university-wide entrepreneurship program. But I've also been into investments my whole life, and so in the back of my head, I've been doing things uh, related to investments uh, since I was probably about 21. So um, that's where Warren Buffett comes into play, and we'll be talking about that today. Yeah. So th- a little bit more about your background. You're, you've got an MBA from University of Wisconsin in Madison. You're a, you're a Badger. I'm a Badger, yeah. <laughs> I went to, to Wisconsin and uh, got an MBA there. And after I got my MBA, I went down to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and uh, applied for a job there because I really wanted to work in the markets. I was fascinated with the markets, and um, they told me that they would start me out as a runner. This is back in 1989 when there was very little technology going on, and so I would be running back and forth to the checker, and the checker would be sending the order up to the trader up uh, in the office. So, you know, you had that whole thing going on there, and they were only going to pay me 7 bucks an hour And I was paying outstate tuition at Wisconsin, and I had a lot of student loans. I just couldn't afford to do it. Even though I wanted to do it, um, I couldn't do it. So that's what kind of led me uh, on to to seek another avenue in my life at that time. And I ended up going on and getting a Ph.D. Uh, Actually, in entrepreneurship, there were only two schools that offered it uh, at the time. Uh, and uh, I got the the PhD in entrepreneurship, and there were only six jobs in the country that were open because I was kind of ahead of my time. I was an entrepreneur within academia, and uh, uh, unfortunately, I didn't get one of the six jobs coming out because all the people that already had jobs were applying for those jobs, and they got those jobs. And so I ended up going to uh, a school in North Carolina, University of North Carolina, uh, Charlotte, and uh, they they allowed me to teach small business management and strategic management. But I I pretty much treated small business management like entrepreneurship when I was there. So uh, that's how I started out my career in, in academia was by going there. And it wasn't even really uh, an entrepreneurship job because uh, that's really what I wanted to, to teach was entrepreneurship. And uh, I ended up eventually going in that direction, and that was my whole career was in entrepreneurship yeah. and Warren Buffett. <laughs> and what, so, yeah, I mean, I, I take it, um, yeah, obviously, we can talk more about the book in a second, which which I should mention has just won a National national Business Book Award. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I actually, yeah. it was uh, the the third best business biography in the country. So it wasn't the top one, but it was the third best. Yeah, congrats. That's fantastic. Yeah, I was pretty excited about that. I put a lot of work into that book that I'll be talking about here in a sec. Yeah. 
Um, it, you mentioned entrepreneurship, and I, and we'll talk more about the book. But when and when you think about Buffett, something I didn't realize about his entrepreneurial path was that he 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 uh, cut his teeth selling gum door to door during his childhood, which I don't think many people know. Is that right? Yeah, he. Uh, the thing that that really surprised me the most in the book was uh, as he was a kid. You know, really young. He was born in August 1930, right in, in the heart of the Depression. And when he was almost two years old, his father lost his job and lost the family's money. And so they were, you know, de they, they didn't have anything. And uh, um, he went to his father. His father... Um, had a grocery store and he asked him for a job and his father said i can't afford to hire you but i can give you food on credit um so he ended up doing that uh in the meantime warren's family you know his his mother was freaking out uh she already came from a a, a family history of mental issues and she started taking out a, a, her frustrations, I guess is a better word, uh, on her kids. Mm -hmm. So they um, would wake up and they would say, you could tell by the tone on her voice what kind of a day it was going to be uh, in the morning. And, you know, Warren would hear that he, he was worthless, you know, as a kid and uh, and his oldest daughter took a lot of the brunt, uh, Doris, of the abuse. And uh, so, you know, it kind of irritates me when I hear people saying, oh, he's had everything, you know, he's a rich guy, da, 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 da. But, you know, you look at his background, and that's probably, in my opinion, what drove him. You know, that kind of yeah, background kind of growing up, and being told that you're worthless, and uh, boom, not not too far after that, he started being an entrepreneur. Yeah. It, it's so interesting. I'm, I'm in the middle of reading Angela Duckworth's book, Grit, which I have never read before. And in it, she talks about her dad also criticizing her as saying, you're no genius. And then she goes on to win the MacArthur, right? From the yeah, yeah. Genius, and then goes on to say that it's all about grit. Uh, that it's not about your smarts, it's not about your money, it's about your grit and your perseverance. Yep, grit and perseverance. That's a, a great point that I learned about Warren Buffett. Uh, we're both of those things, yeah. and that and creativity. How much he values creativity and and thinking outside of the box. He he loves people that that do that. Yeah, you know, one of the first times. I brought um, students to go visit him, and, and the first time that we visited him, he said to us, and he was looking right at me when he said this, he, he goes, uh, uh, the, the most successful business people that I've met in my life are people that have the most business experience that don't necessarily uh, go to these high-powered schools. I won't name them, but he mentioned some of them. Uh, and, uh, but there are people that have the most business experience that think way outside of the box. Yeah. Well, I think you sort of hinted at it, but, but for, for, uh, for posterity, let's talk a little bit about what inspired you to write the book about Warren and, uh, and what do you hope readers, including, uh, those who are listening here will take away from it? Well, I'm hoping that people all over the world, are, you know, typically academics write to a small audience but that's something that I didn't want to do. I wanted to write to the world and I wanted to share with them on how, what they can do to become more financially literate and financially self-supportive so they don't have to rely on other people uh, and how to be a better person. You know, a lot of the, the rich thoughts that Warren has given out throughout the years, I include in the book. Yeah. And the people that have influenced him, uh, like uh, Dale Carnegie, uh, I talk about him in chapter two, and some, some great quotes in there. One by Benjamin Franklin, 
uh, when he talks about, I will speak no evil of any man, only good, uh, which is one of the reasons why he became one of the best ambassadors the United States ever had. So let me, let me ask you, I mean, it, 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 he's obviously well-known. Uh, there are numerous books written about him. Uh, talk about the new perspective uh, or insights that you bring to the table in this, in this new book. That, that was a challenge in writing the book, you know, because there have been quite a few books that have been written on Warren. And uh, I waited nine years before I actually decided to write it while I was involved in a lot of different activities with him. You know, I uh, back in 2007, my cousin Steve Nog told me that they were inviting uh, universities to Omaha to go visit Warren Buffett for a day, and you'd go visit two of his subsidiaries, Nebraska Furniture Mart and uh, uh, Borsheim's, which were both, you know, the largest private furniture and jewelry stores at the time. And you got a two and a half hour Q&A with Warren Buffett. Then you went out to lunch with Warren Buffett. Uh, and then he took a picture with everybody individually, <laughs> you know, and, and as a group. Uh, so I got rejected the first time that I applied. The secretary said that the, you know, the list is years long. Don't even bother to put your name on the list. Even though I knew his son, I went to high school in Omaha. I'm from Omaha. I probably should have mentioned that. Uh, and I went to high school with Peter Buffett at Omaha Central High School, which was an open public high school. Uh, it was very diverse, which says everything about Warren Buffett. You know, he didn't go to this private academy, you know, with yeah. you know, high cost. All he, No, he, you know, Warren sent his kids where everybody else was going, you know, uh, and and Peter was great. Pe Peter was a great kid. He's a couple years older than me. And, and I hung around with a couple of, you know, guys that were older than me that were a, a pretty bright group. And we ate lunch every day in the cafeteria. And, and Peter was with us. And you would never know that his dad was Warren Buffett because back then, that was 1976. Right. Nobody knew Warren Buffett. I mean, Warren Buffett had a lot of money. He probably had 25 mil, all right? But that's not wealthy, as they say today, right? I mean, no. no. <laughs> not Elon Musk wealthy. Right. And, uh, but, uh, you know, you, you would never have known. I'd never heard any of my friends say anything about, hey, Peter's uh, father's Warren Buffett. Nobody ever said that. And, and Pete never acted like, he was any anything special and he had ripped jeans and he wore a baseball cap and he was into music and he was into uh photography and he was on the yearbook staff yeah. um so but he was just the nicest guy in the world just a super nice guy and and uh that was you know kind of my initial uh uh introduction to the buffett family was via Peter Buffett and my brother David knew Howard Buffett or they called him Howie and he played handball over at their house and I interviewed Susie Buffett who's you know the oldest uh, for the book yeah. so I have quotes in the book from Susie Buffett that was kind of fun to get some background and, and introspective about uh, you know the Buffett family and her relationship with Warren yeah um yeah, so that's kind of a, a little bit of a background. And in 2007, I, I tried to get invited to go visit Warren uh, at his corporate headquarters in Omaha, Nebraska. I got rejected. Uh, I wrote a case study on Buffett because uh, I wanted to learn as much as I could about Warren. Over a two-year period, I got accepted at an academic journal. Uh, and then I had this epiphany, why don't I just send the... Uh, the case study to Warren, you know, maybe he'll invite us because I did something outside of the box because right. that's the way my mind was working. Yeah. And I thought, well, maybe there might be a possibility there. Yeah. And sure enough, 10 days later, I got a letter from him inviting me to Omaha that November, the same weekend uh, that he bought 
Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad, and all these people were chasing him around trying to interview him. Yeah. But he didn't want to have anything to do with him because he was with the students. He cared more about the... Warren Buffett said that he would rather be a teacher if he... It, it, if he was not doing what he's doing today, he would be a teacher yeah. or professor, whatever. Yeah. Um, well, he himself had a pretty good teacher, <laughs> if memory serves. Yeah. Um, well, his, his father was, pro he'll tell you his father was the best teacher. Yeah. Oh, really? Not, yeah. not, uh, no, I mean, Benjamin Graham was great, but, uh, but, you know, if in his office, the only picture on the wall, is his father's picture but he did uh he did uh name his kid howard howard uh graham buffett mm. after benjamin graham his middle name so i took you know i took a group of students to go visit him him and i had lunch and i sat right across from him and i had the first question and really the only question that i had award because I did this case study on him and I knew all about him, you know, <laughs> it's not like I had all these great questions to ask. And I said, how do you value a company, Warren? And uh, he just kind of looked at me and he said, uh, the discounted cash flow. That was it. And I thought, no, this guy, there's got to be more to this story than the discounted cash flow. And so I asked him again and he said, the discounted cash flow. He repeated it. So I knew better than to ask him again because I knew he would say the same thing and he'd probably think I was an idiot. <laughs> uh, but, you know, yeah, those are the two the two things that Warren Buffett said. He, he, he's not a big fan of higher education. He abuses it. Him and Charlie do all the time. Yeah. Uh, and he says, you only need two classes to be a successful investor. You know how to value a company and a class on behavior in the financial markets or behavioral finance or whatever they call it behavioral economics in all of the above yeah so actually talk, talk more about that I mean you have a whole chapter on on behavioral biases and I and I guess what can we what uh, you know what can we learn from how Warren applies behavioral bias or how how he looks at behavioral finance or economics and applies it to his investing and what we can learn from that. Well, both him and Charlie definitely say that that's the most important thing yeah. when it comes to uh, investing, and they they call it temperament, and uh, I call it behavioral biases. And I'll tell you, you know, I am so glad I wrote that chapter. You know, um, it has helped me enormously with my own investing and realizing what I'm doing wrong. Mm. Yeah, you know, I, I have caught myself doing stupid things several times, even since I've written the book. Uh, and I've caught myself, oh, you know, I'm with, with the herd today. I'm thinking about being with the herd. <laughs> you know, do I want to be with the herd? Uh, or recency bias is another big one, you know, and loss aversion. Uh, you know, loss aversion is a bad one for me, you know. If you lose money, it feels twice as bad as it does making money. Yeah. And so that chapter is so valuable. And it was really the last chapter that I wrote yeah. in the book. And I spent a lot of time on that chapter. Yeah. Do you, I mean, it, it, it seems like, you know, there's uh, the world has turned its attention. The uh, financial advisors are now thinking about behavioral biases, right? Whether it's recency bias or overconfidence or uh, you, you name it, it's sort of like the thing that they have to learn in order to help their clients manage their, you know, at least accept what they're doing with the money that they manage, right? Like, why are we doing this when it's yeah. like the opposite? Yeah, effort. you know, it's not it's not just the, the investor, it's the, the investment professionals have to deal with all of that as well. Yeah, yeah. How, how do you think it is that when you think about, you know, obviously loss aversion, Daniel Kahneman, Tversky, how is it that um, Warren, with with the size of the portfolio that they manage him and Charlie a, a, at all, that when they deal with losses, <laughs> that it, 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 you know, how do they deal with loss aversion? I think their their premise is 
if you can afford to lose 50% of your investments, you shouldn't be in the market. Yeah. So they just assume every so often their portfolio is going to go down 50%. It's gone down three times 50% mm. uh, since they've formed uh, Berkshire Hathaway. I think, what has that been? A little bit over 50 years, I think. Yeah. 52 years. Yeah. So they just assume that and they're in it for the long term. And, uh, you know, they'll probably buy when it's down. Yeah. You know, and stay within their circle of competence. Yeah. Um, buy, you know, that would be a good time related to margin of safety that they talk about all the time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, do, do you yeah. think they have the advantage, Todd? Like, for instance, with an advisor who's managing a client's portfolio, ultimately it's not an endowment. They have to, at some point, draw down the portfolio. Um, and and in the case of Berkshire Hathaway, uh, it, it's more like an endowment where where it's there is no drawdown to really to come from this portfolio, uh, and th and that's a luxury that they have in some ways. Yeah, I mean he's uh, he's got all this money, you know, and. I mean, his drawdown is charity every year sure. that he gives, and if he what if he hadn't have given all this money already to charity, he'd be the richest man in the world. Yeah, I read that the other day. Yeah. Um, but and by the way, he doesn't plan to give any of it to his children. If I'm if I recall I, well, correctly, yes. you know, or not I, a lot anyway. <laughs> I talked to Susie about that and. Uh, you know, she was very careful about what she said. <laughs> you know, about that. You know, each of uh, the kids got two billion. I think it was ten years or so ago when they started their own foundation. Yeah, and they all focus on like uh, Peter is really into women's issues, you know, and abuse of women and um, things of that nature. He's got a whole list of things that he's into, and Howard's into farming. Yeah. You know, so he goes to Africa, and Susie's into education a lot of, a lot yeah. of it. But uh, yeah, they're they're probably not going to get much, I wouldn't think. And I believe I haven't heard anybody say this, and I haven't read it anywhere that Warren is managing their money in these. Oh, it would make sense, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, who else is going to manage? Why not have the best investor in the world Why not? manage your your foundation money? Yeah. But uh uh yeah, yeah. So he's he it's a lot easier not to have this behavioral bias, the loss aversion when you've got a hundred billion hanging around, right? Yeah. And you don't have to worry about retirement. You know, oh I'm gonna retire in five years, I can't lose any money. Right. So you've got that issue going on inside your head. Well, Warren doesn't have to worry about that, but the common person does. Right, right. It's a little more significant. Yeah. Oh. Um, talk about uh, obviously you, you mentioned disc, uh, discounted cash flows, and uh, you know one of the key themes of his investing career has been about the importance of value investing. Can you explain what that means and how he applies that strategy? Is it is it solely because of this kind of cash flows or is it other things as well? Well, I'll be honest with you. I don't think anybody knows exactly what he does, mm. you know, because when you look at the market um, and, and the market's down, a, you know, a percent, he'll be sometimes even up. <laughs> so so uh, I don't think we really know exactly what he's up to. And I know that he uses some options um, and, and, you know, I haven't read very much about that. I know there was a really long paper that talked a little bit about that. Um, but, you know, in general, I would say, you know, he does use the DCF. He's looking for a margin of safety, stays within a circle of competence. Uh, he's not into, he diversifies in the sense that he has 62 separate private companies that he owns. But when it comes to a stock portfolio, uh, uh, Apple is over 40% of that. And the, the top four investments are 70% yeah. of that investment portfolio. So he, he's not a big fan of, uh, diversification, uh, in his stock portfolio. I would say overall, yes, 
Because he has 62 private companies. Mm, okay. Yeah. But when you own Coke and Burlington and um, uh, and Ameriprise or, you know, on and on and on, right? Or, Ameri or American Express, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you, you, you have to have large enough companies to commit large enough sums so you're not moving the market every time you're buying and selling, right? And, and you know what's cool about Warren is, is that he's already done his work on these companies. He knows they're good companies. And when the market goes down, he can put more money to work in them, right? Yeah. yeah. I know he just did that with Bank of America. He puts right. some, some money to work with them again. Yeah. Because they've been they haven't been doing that great lately. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit, if you don't mind. He's obviously he's incredibly successful, but he's also uh, very humble. Uh, he's known for his humility, his personal values. He, if, if memory serves, he's still living in the same house that he's been in for decades now. And, and uh, you know, maybe talk about the traits that have influenced this philosophy and decision making. It's, uh, uh, I, I want to inherit his his residence when he passes on. That's why I was, <laughs> and, and, and convert it into a Buffett museum. I have, uh, it's funny because uh, I've been giving some presentations. I was at the last shareholder meeting and I gave uh, three presentations at it. And one of them was uh, a picture, a slide of all of Warren Buffett's uh, houses when he was growing up. Yeah. So that was kind of fun to talk about. And here's where he lives right now. And he, he used to have no gate. And uh, now he has this big gate and you can't even see in. And, uh, even in Omaha. And that was one of the reasons why he wanted to go to Omaha is he wanted to get away from all the, the, the noise. And uh, he liked Omaha. His family was in Omaha. It's a great place to grow up if you have a family. Uh, the, the values uh, of Omaha, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Midwestern, wholesome, Midwestern values, yeah. honest, um, all that stuff. And you wouldn't know it by talking to Warren Buffett that he was – you know, what is he now, the eighth richest man in the world or something like that? It doesn't really matter, you know, when you get up that high. Uh, he would He's like your grandfather. He's just a, a humble guy. He, he, he doesn't talk over your head, uh, which is something that I wanted to do in my book. You know, I don't want to talk over people's heads. There might be one chapter where it's a little bit over the, the non-financial people's head, but everybody else... It's, uh, it's not an easy read, but it, it's, uh, it's a good read, good, uh, uh, biography slash investment slash, um, uh, how to be a better person book. Um, but yeah, Warren is, uh, uh, I have a chapter on his mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. Which, about those. yeah. which uh. You know, there's a couple of things that I I missed out on when I was doing all this research on Warren. Um, one was uh, the valuation thing. Okay, everybody uses like computers today to do their valuation work and all that other stuff. Well, I'm kind of old school, and uh, I wanted to know how how to figure out the valuation of a real world example because I never saw it in any Warren Buffett book. How do you do it? You know, show me how to do it. Don't just talk in all these words. Yeah. I, I want to know how to do it. And nobody did that in any of these books. So I did it. I did it in chapter six and it took me a long time to do all this stuff. And to look at all the, the metrics that he looks at and to calculate them out and to find them, uh, you know, over a 10 year period and to, to look at the percentages and then to do a DCF uh, formula and, and, you know, put in the right numbers. And, uh, and I used Apple as the example and I followed Apple from the first time that they bought it uh, all the way up to uh, 2022. Um, so that was one thing that I was really, really happy with that, that I did in the book. And uh, usually my friends that are non-financial just kind of, they, they start reading that chapter because they know it's going to be tough the second time around. Uh, and uh, 
the other thing is I never really saw too much about his mistakes. Yeah. You know, and Warren talks about his mistakes. You know, he'll come out, you know, at the start of the, the uh, Berkshire meeting, you know, I've been to like 12 or 13 of the last meetings, uh, and he'll start, it, he'll start them out by saying, I'm sorry, I made a mistake this year. This is what I did wrong, you know, and, yeah. and uh, uh, he'll tell you about it. So I just decided, hey, I'm going to look at all of his major mistakes, and I'm going to put them in the chapter, and I'm going to use the behavioral bias chapter and try and uh, figure out why did Warren make that mistake what bias caused him to make that mistake. And then hopefully we can, as readers, investors, learn from his, his mistakes. Yeah. Uh, can you give me an example of one of his biggest mistakes that's sort of his top of mind for you? Um, well, his biggest mistake, he'll tell you, was buying Berkshire Hathaway. Mm. And uh, it was an emotional mistake because his father died five days before he actually uh, purchased the company and the CEO agreed to sell his share, shares in the company uh, and, and at a certain price. And then he sent, the CEO sent his letter to Warren at 0.125 cents less than what he, he mentioned to Warren. And it really made Warren furious that this guy lied to him yeah, and he ended up buying the whole company because of that. And according to Warren, if he wouldn't have bought that company, he, uh, he would use that money to buy an insurance company and which would have netted Berkshire Hathaway 400 to $500 billion more. So that was his biggest mistake, but there's, uh, you know, mistakes of omission that, as well. That, that his biggest mistake, the the textile company in New Bedford, Massachusetts, is now you know becomes the name of the company that is now exactly. Exactly. Right. exactly. You know, and, and you know, I've talked to people about that. They go, "Well, why does he keep the Berkshire Hathaway?" And some people say, "Oh, he does that because he he wants to be remembered for his mistake and not to do it again." Quite a story. Um. There's mistakes of omission. Yeah. You know, he could have bought Google at the IPO. Yeah. He could have bought Microsoft. Uh, but there's the whole issue with Bill Gates and him. And uh, that's another huge about that, uh, That's another, maybe a, a topic for another podcast. But but actually, let, let, me, let, me, let me just ask, because I think it speaks to his Midwestern values that um, in the wake of Bill Gates' uh, admission of uh, and divorce and et cetera, et cetera, that it seemed like their friendship frayed a bit uh, after after you know Bill Gates's peccadillos were exposed. Yeah, I think you know his his omission of Microsoft happened before that, right? Before that, uh, and that was kind of a mess too because Warren was giving all this money to uh, the the nonprofit in in Seattle. What what was that called? The Bill Gates yeah. Foundation. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. See, I've already forgot about it because Warren never talks about it anymore. Uh, but he was giving all of his money uh, to the Bill Gates Foundation. Then Bill dropped off of being on the board. And I think Warren was on the board and he dropped. Yeah. For being the bo on the board. And yeah. And he's, but he's still giving a lot of money to them. Yeah. But I wouldn't be surprised if he gave money to somebody else. After he passed away, it really wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah. What when you think about his philanthropy besides Gates, are are there other sort of philanthropic ventures that he's involved in that that people ought to know about and gives us insight? Um, in yeah, there is uh, Girls Inc. Yeah. Um, and I I gave a talk at at the shareholder meeting with the head of Girls Inc. Um, with a, a bunch of people from. China. Yes. Um, that was interesting. And there's another one that's in San Francisco that he gives to the poor. Uh, and the name of that, I can't remember right offhand, but there's another one that's in downtown San Francisco. He's been giving money to them forever. 
And I don't think he's doing the the lunches anymore. He was uh, getting all this this uh, money from these lunches and giving it to charity as well. Mm -hmm. uh, at Smith and Wolinsky's in New York City, they'd have lunch with him, and that's actually how he got uh, Ted and Todd, his co CIOs, both did a, a lunch with him at mm -hmm. Smith and Wolinsky's. Yeah, but uh. He's doing that. Um, pretty much, he's just giving a certain amount away to uh, the Bill Gates Foundation every year. And Charlie has his own deal that's going on. Warren also has the 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 giving pledge. That's it. The giving I, pledge, I, which is, yeah. you know, people that are really wealthy will give half their money when they die. Yeah. And I actually have a friend of mine who's a a Chinese American who is looking at having some Chinese people join that, um, which is kind of interesting. And um, it would be nice to, to see China and the U.S. become a little bit more um, closer. And Warren and Charlie talk about that all the time. Yeah. That there's no need for us for the tit tat. The world would be a much better place if we got along. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Charlie Warren. Obviously, you mentioned his age uh, a bit ago, kind of. Um, and they've named a successor. Any thoughts about that um, and what that looks like? Yeah, I, 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 I think uh, he uh, he should do a really good job. Um, uh, Charlie and uh, they talked about it at the meeting uh, this year, and. They said, <laughs> I can't believe they said it in front of the, the guy, uh, uh, that you'd really have to be kind of an idiot to screw up what we've built. That's basically what they said. Uh, and so, you know, related to, which brings me around to what's going to happen to the stock price yep. when Warren dies. Yep. Charlie, uh, I'm, I'm not as concerned about because I think Warren is is uh, really the, the person that you, you have to worry about when he passes away. And so I think the stock price will dive a little bit, but I think it'll come back because they've got that thing. They figured this out. They've been working on this issue for over a hundred years between them mm -hmm. to figure out the problem. Uh, and I think they've got the right guy in place. They've got a lot of smart people there. Uh, and, um, I think in the long term, it, it should be an okay in, investment. I don't know about it be, beating the S&P, you know, but time will tell, right? Yeah. So if you if you think about like the most important lesson that investors can learn from his career uh, and by reading your book, is there one or a couple things that sort of stick out besides discounted cash flow? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Oh, I would say on a personal level, on a personal level, uh, you know, if you're 20 years old and you went to some of these uh, visits with Warren Buffett, and he, one of the first things that he would say to us was, the most important decision that you'll make in your life is who you marry. Hmm. So, you know, I wish I would have known that when I was 20 years old. Uh, and... So for your young listeners out there, that will help them. Yeah, and and and, and just for point of reference, he's been married to the same woman forever, right? Uh, no, he's on a second wife. Okay. His first wife died. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, I I like that one. I like. Uh, let's see, there's another one that I like. Oh, I know what it is. And I say this to my students every semester several times. Uh, you know, hang around with people that love you and care about you that want you to be successful. Uh, and it's easy to get caught up with people that don't respect you or demean you or make fun of you, uh, you know, if you don't have the right mind. Yeah. You don't need that. Uh, and you deserve better. Yeah. Um, 
So, but he, he, he calls it surround yourself with people that are better than you. That's what he calls it. But I call it something else. Yeah. Uh, and Warren talks about the importance and the most powerful thing in the world is uh, unconditional love. Mm. And he says, if you've got a couple people that love you unconditionally, you're a very lucky person. Yeah. But, you know, professionally, a lot of the, the things that I said before is, yeah. you know, hold for the long term, you know, margin of safety, circle of competence. Those those are the main tenets, I think, of, of the Warren Buffett philosophy. Yeah. Would you would you in, add in brand equity into that discussion? Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and what he looks for, the specifics, you know, and the management team and you know, how they're compensated and how do they treat their shareholders and how do they reinvest their money. Yeah. Well, what do you think is a, a, a common uh, misconception about Warren that people you've met and you've had lunch with him now three times, you've researched him for this book, et cetera, et cetera. Is there, are there some misconceptions and people just sort of get wrong about Warren? Yeah, that's funny that you, you asked that, Bob. Uh, because that was one of the questions that I asked uh, Susie. Uh -huh. I had a whole list of questions I asked her, and um, and she said, you know, the thing that people don't understand about my father is how much he cares about people, how much he cares about human rights, mm -hmm. about women's rights, you know, the disadvantaged people. And she said, uh, this was interesting, she said that, at the dinner table growing up, there was always a person, a disadvantaged person sitting at dinner with them at the table because, uh, you know, another person that influenced his, his life significantly was his first wife, Susie, and she was really into helping other people. Mm. And uh, so she would always have, you know, a person, uh, a disadvantaged person sitting uh, at at the dinner table and Susie was, Susie's, you know, it was, you know, for a kid to have that, that's quite amazing to have, to experience that, that. Think about it. If you were a kid and you had that being exposed to that growing up, um, but people don't understand that because, you know, they didn't yeah. talk to Susie Buffett Yeah, and Susie. And I talked about that a, a little bit in the book. Yeah. You, you, you talk about this this human side of Warren. I, I think sometimes people also wonder about his politics and 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 at times what might seem contrary to what a businessman might want. I, if memory serves, I I think he's uh you know has never really come out against a, a wealth tax, if I'm not mistaken, or or other things that might be sort of like whatever what you might think a investor businessman would want or not want. Anything yes, else? and he probably could move a lot of his stuff offshore and not have to worry about taxes, right? But he doesn't. He he, he brags about paying taxes. This is how much I pay. Yeah. And, and if it's lower than his secretary, he'll, he, he'll be mad about it. Right. And say, you guys are screwing up. Yeah. So well, that's Mark that's the, the thing that, that I like about Buffett is is – one of the things that I love about Buffett is that you know he's going to be open and honest with you about what's going on. And, like, if there's a catastrophe going on, like the Great Recession, he was the guy that I wanted to listen to. Here. During the the uh, uh, COVID. The, yeah, I was trying to come up with the word. Sorry. COVID crisis. Yeah. Uh, he came on and I made sure I hit the record button before Buffett was on and I could go back and I could listen to what he said over and over again. Don't do anything. Don't do anything. That's what he told us to do. And sure enough, he was right. Yeah. So he, he's often right on these things. Yeah. Well, he's had the benefit. I, I, I once interviewed a gentleman who uh, was a working stockbroker during the 29 crash and still a working stockbroker during the 87 crash. Wow. And and his advice to me at the time in 87 was, oh, these things go in cycles, you know. And so it was like having a long-term perspective about things. And and it seems like, you know, uh, that's the one tenet, right, that, that it, uh, successful investors have is they stay the course. But it's it's easier said than done. 
right, Bob? Yeah. You know, we can sit here and we can talk about it, but, you know, if you're two or three years away from retirement and your portfolio just went down 25%, what are you going to do? Uh, if you're like most average human beings, not Warren Buffett, you panic. Right? You yeah, panic. exactly. <laughs> So I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that there's probably a different answer depending on each person's situation, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, actually that may lead to this question about like, so what advice would you give to someone who wants to invest like Buffett? Is it sort of like to sort of just be, to, to, uh, I think at the last, last national, at the last Herald meeting, they talked about not reading the daily newspaper and reading history books and tuning out all the noise, right? It's sort of like, you know. Don't 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 worry about the present. Just stay the course, right? Is that is that the message if you want to invest like Warren? You know, I I think I I listened to a interview with Howard Marks about two or three weeks ago, and he was talking about Warren Buffett and his success, and he said, you know, one of the things that Warren does really well versus everybody else is he ignores what's not important. Mm. And that's basically what you were just talking about there. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I, so I, which brings me to this question about the biggest challenge challenges facing investors today. I think about uh, a shrinking public market, right? Fewer publicly traded companies than ever before. Uh, the rise of ETFs, both passive and active. The rise of um, ESG. The rise of cryptocurrency. We're we're dealing with a world that didn't exist when you know when Warren Buffett was first being you know taught how to invest by the great masters of value investing. What 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 are these challenges? What what do you see as the challenges that investors are facing today? Well, in a way, you're kind of talking about active versus passive investing, right? Yeah. Um. I'll I'll speak for Warren Buffett, based on what you just said. Uh, if you're not willing to put the work in to be a full-time investor uh, every day, then you should be a, a passive investor. And uh, he said this, I think, for the first time at a shareholder meeting about seven or eight years ago, puts 90% of your money in the SPY, mm -hmm. the S&P 500, and 10% in a short-term bond. Uh, he didn't talk about that like the first five or six shareholder meetings I went to. I don't know why all of a sudden he came up and started talking about that, but he did. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so that's what I would tell, you know, investors or, you know, give your money to to a financial planner who will help you. Uh, and I know my wife I got married later in life, and uh, I said I don't want to manage your money uh, to my wife because I know that would, if I screwed up, that our marriage would be over. And uh, uh, and I am by no means an expert in, in investing, and I know that, and I'm realistic about that. So we we searched for a financial uh, planner. We got one who's really good. And his costs are not very high. It's only like a half a percent, which okay. is pretty good. Yeah. And he's a good guy. You know, I trust him. Yeah. We both trust him. Uh, and uh, we meet with him a couple times every year. I would recommend to your uh, financial planners to, you know, be open and be honest with your clients. Be proactive and set up appointments with them mm -hmm. and let, let your clients know where they stand and, you know, that's coming from a real world perspective, from my perspective, in dealing with financial planners. Yeah, and, and dealing with one of the greatest investment minds of all time. That's uh, you know you have a unique perch, Todd, no doubt. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, I, I don't mean to criticize financial planners. I'm just telling you what Warren Buffett tells us, yeah. the ninety ten. Yeah, and he even said. When he dies, his wife is going to get ninety ten. <laughs> so he that if he's giving ninety ten to his wife when he dies, I mean, yeah, what what choice was mere mortals have? Exactly. Uh yeah, you know. Uh, yeah. So what are you working on next? Anything fun? You got a papers, grants, um, another book? 
I'm actually looking at AI really closely. Okay. Tell me more. Uh, well, I'm using it. I think we talked about that earlier. We uh, did. I'm using it, uh, and it's making my life easier for everybody out there. Uh, you know, I'm doing a PR release uh, on my book, and I just, you know, put into chat GPT, you know, write a PR release on my new book about Warren Buffett. <laughs> and, and, uh, it came out, and it was really a beautiful <laughs> PR piece. Sure. So uh, it could start thinking about using AI in your work, you know, because I think it can really help you significantly and speed up things for you. Yeah. And so that's kind of what I, where I'm at. I'm kind of looking at AI and trying to learn more about it and talk to people. Uh, but at the same time, I'm trying to learn more about uh, Warren Buffett and his valuation thing, because um, his valuation thing, I, I am not 100% sure that I understand everything that he does. And I'm yeah. still working on that. Um, and that is still a work in progress for me, and I think for a lot of people. Yeah. I um, Before before I ask you to drill down on that, I want to, at the shareholder meeting, Charlie Munger was asked about his views on artificial intelligence, and the and the quote is, I'll read it, I'm personally skeptical of some of the hype that has gone into artificial intelligence. I think old old fashioned intelligence works just as <laughs> is just as good or so, just as fine or something. Words to that effect. Works. I think old fashioned intelligence works pretty well. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, yeah, Charlie. Just everybody laughed when he said that. Yeah, which is great. He so, was the old Charlie. <laughs> you know, if you've ever gone, I, I recommend all your financial planners out there go to a shareholder meeting. If you haven't been one, you are missing out. Yeah. You know, it's something that you need to go to. Yeah. I've never been, I want to go, the only time I've ever met um, Warren was years ago when he owned uh, stock, and many years ago, I'm talking in the 1980s, when he owned stock in um, Gillette at the time, before it was purchased by Procter & Gamble, and he would come to the annual Gillette meeting in South Boston, and uh, we got a chance to ask him questions and, and whatnot, and there he was next to, I think, Col Coleman Markler was the chairman or CEO of Gillette at the time. And that was my only experience with Warren was, you know, that many years ago, you know, asking him questions about his ownership in Gillette. Yeah. He made a lot of money on that. <laughs> he did. Yeah. I'll, I'm actually surprised that he sold it. Yeah. Because they have such a huge market share. Yeah. Well, no one's shaving anymore. So uh, there's, there is. Uh, <laughs> maybe that's why he did it. All right, so so actually, so let me drill down. Let me ask this final question about you, you know. So for all the work that you've done and all the analysis about how we invest and how he makes decisions, uh, and for the chapter that you have on the book, you're still learning more about how he does what he does. Yeah, you know, I I'm not a hundred percent convinced that I know exactly what he does. I don't. I haven't met anybody that does. You know, maybe his inside circle knows, you know, a couple people. Um, but I'm I'm not convinced that I know the whole story and how he hedges himself, you know, like today. I'll give you an example. The market was down like point five percent and he was up point two percent. So, you know, it makes me think oh, why why don't I own more Berkshire Hathaway? <laughs> you know? Right. Well, it, so, right. There is that school of thought that says, uh, why should I own the SPY when I can own, right, BRK kind of thing? There right? was an argument two years ago between Warren, it wasn't an argument, but a discussion. Uh, should I own SPY or should I own Berkshire? Between yeah. the two. Yeah. So Warren took SPY. He said, I think you'd do better with SPY over the long term, probably because they're too big. And and Charlie said, no, nope, I think you should own Berkshire. Berkshire, he was just convinced that you should own Berkshire. And mm -hmm. uh, so last year, Berkshire was up 4% and the market was down 19%. Mm -hmm. And uh, this year, they're underperforming the market. So, yeah. 
But, you know, I in, in my last chapter, I talk about th they've underperformed the market a little bit um, previous to last year, but they're probably outperforming, including last year. Yeah. So uh, I I still think, you know, it's I, I, I can't I probably shouldn't say, you know, whether to buy it or not, but and just look at his track record. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we're, we've we, we're almost uh, we've almost talked for sixty minutes. Um, is, is there anything that we haven't touched upon that you think we you ought to mention, or anything that just bears re-emphasizing before we wrap up? Not not that I can think of. Uh, I just you know I, I wish everybody the best of luck, and uh, feel free to contact me if you if you need anything, uh, have any questions, or uh, and I want to thank Bob for inviting me yeah. onto the show. It's it's been nice getting to know you. Uh, and nice being on the show, and I think you're doing a service to everybody out there. Thanks, Paul. thank you, Todd. And I'll, I, I highly recommend that everyone go on to their whatever bookseller of choice and and buy your latest book uh, uh, because uh, I think there's lots to learn uh, yeah. there for our audience and for not only for the FAs who are listening but for their clients as well. So, Todd, Thanks, thank Bob. you so much. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you for listening to the Exceptional Advisor podcast brought to you by the Investments and Wealth Institute. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe through iTunes, Spotify, or our website at www.investmentsandwealth.org forward slash podcast to get the latest episodes of our Exceptional Advisor podcast series. For additional resources, updates on events, and exclusive membership deals, visit www.investmentsandwealth.org. Join us online for a unique virtual conference experience, Life Cycle Planning, What Goes Around Comes Around, taking place on September 19th, 2023. Unlike other events that primarily cater to a select few, this conference is designed to provide strategies that are applicable to a broader audience. Irrespective of age, geographical origin, or the position on the wealth spectrum, Attending this event will equip you with valuable insights to immediately enhance the value you offer to clients. Furthermore, we are proud to announce that a percentage of the proceeds generated from sponsorships and registrations will be dedicated to the Investments in Wealth Foundation Scholarship Program. This program empowers women, diverse professionals, and future leaders to advance their careers and make a meaningful contribution to our field. Don't miss out on this opportunity. Register today at iwicentral.org slash LCP to secure your spot.